Last time uh, we discussed religion uh, and its potential impact on health, including effects it might have via changes in behavior, social support, and even symbolic ideation, the kind of symbolic potential uh, symbolic impact of religion. We also considered this sort of interesting, from a point of view of the history of science, or sociology of science, uh, idea of this sort of burgeoning interest in uh, intercessory prayer and the use of a kind of sci formal scientific approach to study it. Uh, I think, I think, I, I can't remember if I discussed this at the end of class or in front of all of you or just with some students that stayed afterwards. It's a kind of a perplexing kind of phenomenon from my perspective because it reflects, I think, uh, a kind of stress in our society right now about the different roles of <coughs> science as a way of understanding the world and maybe religion and politics or other things which are, have more to do with our opinions, let's say, uh, way of understanding the world. And I think that this sort of efflorescence of these studies at this historical moment reflects a kind of stress or juncture uh, with respect to these different ways of approaching uh, modernity. Um, so let's begin today by considering the following uh, overarching idea. What does it mean to say that one thing uh, that, that one thing is a cause of another thing. Um, and this is an old question, of course, and here's what Aristotle had to say. So Aristotle imagined that when, when we speak of one thing causing another thing, there are four kinds of causes. Now raise your hands if you've encountered this idea before in your education. Very few of you. Okay, this is like a really foundational, important set of ideas uh, from Aristotle and, and Plato and sort of the ancient Greeks which sort of, whether you realize it or not, infuses lots of all kinds of other topics that you're thinking about in your education. Anyway, Aristotle had the following to say. He said there are different, four different causes of things. The material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. Now, the material cause is that out of which a thing comes to be. For example, bronze or silver is used to make swords or jewelry. That's the cause. And the formal cause is the statement of essence, or the account of what it is to be. The efficient cause is the primary source of change. For example, the man who gives advice, or the father of the child. And the final cause is the end, that for the sake of which a thing is done. For example, health is a cause of exercise. Or, in one of the classic examples that Aristotle gave with respect to a table and these four causes, wood is what the table is made out of. Wood is the cause of the table. Having four legs and a flat top is what it is to be a table. That's what makes this thing a table. That's what makes it, you know, brings it into being, is that it has four legs and a top. And then a carpenter is what produces a table. So the carpenter is the cause of the table in the efficient cause. And eating on and writing on is what the table is for. That's why we make a table. That's what the cause of a table is, the final cause. So from this perspective, we can think of causes of death either in terms of whether they are the formal causes, the disease itself, or the efficient causes, let's say the risk factors of different sorts. So with this sort of general perspective, we can begin to reframe the causes of death we've been discussing so far. So on the left is our usual list that we've been, for the last month or two we've been thinking about, the top ten leading killers in the United States. And this is how we've been considering them so far. But we could have a completely different way of imagining the causes of death in our society as shown on the right. Now the causes are seen as being tobacco, or uh, dietary and activity uh, behaviors, alcohol, microbial agents toxic agents, medical error, firearms, sexual behavior, uh, vehicle accidents, and illicit drugs. And these are the ways that these causes add up. So on the left-hand side, I think uh, these on the right account for one, nearly 1 1.2 million deaths, uh, so about 50% of the total uh, if you reconfigure the causes on the right as compared with on the left. So a totally different way of speaking about the causes of death in the United States. Instead of saying it's uh, stroke or COPD or diabetes, now we're going to think about them as risk factors or death, a different way of imagining the causes. And in fact, the estimates that are on the right have been generated as much as possible to isolate the pure effect of each cause. But these causes, of course, can have additive or even synergistic effects. 
so that being obese and alcoholic is multiplicatively worse for you than, than the mere summation of those two risk factors. And these exposures have multifarious ways of killing us. Tobacco causes not just lung cancer, this is commonly uh, understood, but also head and neck cancer, or esophageal cancer, or bladder cancer, as your kidneys concentrate the carcinogens in the tobacco smoke and it sits in your bladder, smoking tobacco is a big risk for bladder cancer in a different part of your body. And tobacco also causes coronary artery disease, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and pneumonia, and premature births and neonatal deaths, and burns. People die from being burned uh, alive, actually, uh, from smoking. In fact, 3,000 people die every year in the United States just from inhaling the smoke that other people exhale. So tobacco is killing people who are not even the consumers of tobacco. And it's a similar story with diet and exercise. Suboptimal levels of diet and exercise don't just cause you know, heart attacks, but also can contribute to cancer in the form of colon and breast cancer, diabetes, and so forth. And alcohol contributes to liver disease, motor vehicle accidents, digestive diseases, and cancer. And toxic agents can include occupational exposures, environmental pollutants, food contamination, and so forth. And these causes, the toxic exposures, are likely to rise with a global warming and different kinds of environmental degradation that we're inflicting on our planet. And as for firearms, this is yet again another epidemic uh, of deaths due to firearms in our society, in particular, sort of unusually in the developed world, and we'll come back to that uh, uh, next time. So changing how we see these causes, how we begin to speak about the causes of death, uh, can affect policy and has a number of ex uh, implications. We spend about $900 billion, nearly a trillion dollars on healthcare every year, but less than 5% of that amount is spent on prevention, is spent on addressing the causes of death as seen on the right rather than uh, on the left. Okay? So shifting our way of thinking about the cause of death then has implications not only for how you potentially live your own lives, not only potentially for how doctors practice medicine, but also for public policy interventions in terms of how we allocate resources or organize our healthcare system. So this is not just a kind of philosophical, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, idle theorizing. Again, it has implications. So today we're going to be discussing obesity and exercise and diet, and next time we'll take up smoking, alcohol, you know, the tobacco, uh, what is it, the uh, tobacco, firearms, and alcohol. What's the Bureau of, what is it called? The Bureau of ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. We'll cover the uh, billet of the ATF uh, next time. So let's get a handle on what various uh, body mass indices uh, look like. So the body mass index, or the BMI, is your weight in kilograms, divided by your height expressed in meters, quantity squared. So we measure your height in meters, we square it, we put that in the denominator, and in the numerator we put your weight in kilograms, and we compute your BMI, and the standard threshold for being obese is taken if you have a BMI of above 30. So here are what different sorts of BMIs look like, uh, from the right to the left. So on, this is a prototypical woman, you know, five foot, six inches tall, and if she weighs 124 pounds on the far right, her BMI is 20, and then you move from right to left. Right around here, she's crossing the threshold for being clinically obese with a body weight of 186 pounds, and she's this height. And here she's becoming so-called morbidly obese if her body weight is 248 pounds, her BMI is 40 uh, at that height. And here's the guys, uh, leaving aside his choice of underwear. Uh, you know, here he's a 6'1", and, uh, and you know, this is what he looks like at this uh, weight of 151 pounds. Here he crosses at 227 pounds, he's crossing the threshold to uh, be obese. This is what would be considered clinically obese in our society. And here this is morbidly obese at 300 pounds, a BMI of 40 in this situation. And this is, these sort of on the upper end of the spectrum here has significant implications uh, for the men and for the women uh, on, um, if you're this size. And this slide shows the percentage of people who are obese, whose BMI is above 30, by sex and race and by time period. So this is using nationally representative data across time. So, uh, so in, in this time period, in the early 70s, 13.9% of white women were obese, 11.9% of white men, 28.5% of black women were obese, and 14.9% of black men were obese. And if you come forward in time, now, I mean, it actually it's even worse now, so going, this is about 10 years old now, 30.6% of white women were obese as of 2002, 27.5% of men, almost half, now more than half, 
of African American women in our society have a body mass index of above 30, are clinically obese. 25% uh, of men, and now introducing the kind of further category that was introduced in the 80s of Mexican American uh, men and women, these are the percentages uh, that are shown there. And unsurprisingly, there is variation by gender. Men and women are different in their prevalence of obesity. Race and ethnicity, blacks, whites, Mexicans, is shown here. And time, across time, uh, our society is becoming progressively uh, bigger. Men are less likely to be obese than women. Whites are less likely to be obese than blacks and Mexicans. And obesity increases across time. And in fact, since 1970, it's doubled. And in fact, if you consider both overweight, that is to say a BMI above 25, and obese. Together, more than two-thirds of Americans now are overweight or obese. We are unrecognizable compared to our society 50 years ago, or 40 years ago even, just looking around, uh, 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 walking through the streets in our society. <coughs> and this reports the same numbers as in the previous slide in the same cells, but now by body mass index. So this is the average BMI of white women, white men, black women, black men, uh, and so forth up to the present. And the average BMI of African American women in our society is above 30. So the average now is uh, 31 in this situation. Uh, and then compared to black men, so they're, on average, black women are more likely to be obese, have a higher BMI uh, than black men, and blacks have higher BMIs uh, than whites uh, in this uh, situation. And the population distribution of weight keeps shifting uh, to the right across the whole distribution. It's a kind of secular shift, just like the shift in blood pressure we saw a few lectures ago, with the whole distribution shifting. It's not like certain segments of the population or segment, certain segments of the distribution are gaining weight. The whole distribution is shifting from left to right. So if you keep the thresholds intact, so here is uh, overweight is 25, obese is at 30, morbidly obese is at 40, uh, and then if you look at the time periods, these are the distributions actually uh, from 1990 to 2004, 2010, and the projected distributions from 2020 and 2023, you have the smooth shift uh, uh, shifting uh, to the right. So something is likely obesogenic in our society. It's not just one subset gaining weight. Something is changing in our environment that makes across the whole spectrum of types of people and, and body sizes, everyone is gaining weight. Some more rapidly than others, but most everyone is gaining weight. And people are getting so big that hospitals are having to make all kinds of adjustments. Special chairs and hoists and special CT scanners, like bigger CT scanners. When I went to medical school, there was this little tiny uh, little hole that you had to go through for the T CT scanner, but eventually we couldn't fit the patients through the scanner. So we needed, sometimes it was horrible that when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, we would get patients so big we had to send them to the vet school to use the veterinary scanner. Uh, but you know now we have bigger scanners in our hospitals so we can scan people that are big and they can fit through this little donut for the CT and MR, MRI uh, scanners. Uh, even the needles are getting longer so you can get through more layers of people's fat uh, to, to, to administer medications or draw blood. So when I started medical school you'd open up the drawer at the bedside table, they had little tiny needles this long, now they're getting this long so you can do what you need to do in order to take care of patients. In fact, there are thousands of workplace injuries in hospital workers each year just taking care of overweight patients. Just moving people around is resulting in uh, you know, uh, health care problems for these people. So these are two uh, young uh, nurses and you know, moving this patient. This patient has difficulty moving herself, poor woman, uh, but then moving her, this requires special equipment to move her from place to place to give her the health care that she needs. In fact, the obesity epidemic is also affecting these other types of devices. So manufacturers are now manufacturing special gurneys to move patients around. And this is not just you know, people that are really at the upper end of the distribution. The kinds of gurneys we had in hospitals when I was a medical student weren't adequate to transport people that were 300 pounds, let's say. Now it's not uncommon that people will come in that are, are that heavy. And so you need special equipment to do that with you know, special supports and special apparatus. This, for, this gurney will support up to 1,600 pounds uh, a human being uh, if they were that big, which of course is exceedingly rare. Now I'd like, to spend, uh, I'd like to spend a little time exploring the link of the individual level and population level correlates of obesity beyond gender and race and ethnicity that I've already introduced you to. 
So this slide introduces the idea of, uh, of the, or, or explores the relationship between obesity and wealth or income. Here measured by something known as the poverty income ratio, which is a standardized measure of income shown on the x-axis. And the y-axis is the BMI. So these are richer people over here, poor people over there, measured by this metric. And this is the BMI here. So heavier people are here and lighter people are here. And this is, once again, the three time periods that we're discussing. So what this slide suggests is that the relationship between wealth and income was always that richer people were thinner, even going back to the 1970s. Okay? So in the 1970s, the richest people had an average BMI of just above 24, and the poorest people had an average BMI of, uh, of you know, just under 27. But what's happening across time is the whole curve is shifting up to the point now where in the most recent time period shown here, the richest <coughs> white women now have the average BMI of the poorest white women uh, 30 years ago. Okay? So 30 years ago, the average, the poorest white women had a BMI of you know, just under 27, and now uh, the richest ones are uh, you know, approaching that, 27 and a half, 27.6 is the average. So the set point for the relationship between, so on one hand, the wealth, the relationship, there's always a gradient, richer is thinner, but the set point is changing across time and is moving up steadily uh, as time goes by. And the big leap appears to have occurred in the 1980s. So you've got a period of stability here in the first two curves from the early 70s to the late 70s, but then all of a sudden something happens in our society uh, during the early 1980s and everyone begins to get bigger across the entire uh, income spectrum. And this is another way to appreciate that we are in the midst of an epidemic that is affecting all sectors of the society, men and women, black and white, rich and poor, everyone uh, is affected by this epidemic. For men, the curves are flatter, if not flat, so there's less of a relationship between income and body size in men. The lines are flat across the distribution, but we still see this shifting uh, uh, set point moving up across time, where all the men are getting bigger uh, as well. Well, how might wealth and weight be related? And as usual, the relationship can go one way, both ways, or some third way, or all of the above. So it's possible that something about your wealth contributes to your weight status. If you're richer, you have better resources, you have a better diet, more leisure time, or places for exercise, more feelings of self-efficacy, you know, you feel more in control of your life, and that allows you not only to gather wealth, but also to, to lose weight, control your body size better. Uh, and there are also variations in aesthetic norms and expectations amongst different classes of society. You had a, a powerful reading in your readings for today called Black Women and Weight from the New York Times, which really illustrates the complexity of this, at least through the lens of race. But the same kinds of arguments can be made in other ways. Uh, so the different classes of society might have different ideas about what is a normal body size. And that also can affect, can cause you to have an early shift from income to weight by changing your norms about what an acceptable body size is. Or conversely, the relationship could be from weight status to income. right? So bigger people could be discriminated against in a variety of ways. Uh, they could have uh, discrimination, uh, discriminatory practices, or they could have labor and marriage market performance could be affected. So bigger people might be less able to earn money in a variety of reasons, or, must, or might wind up with lower quality spouses. And we know that better quality spouses also is, uh, has all kinds of economic and health benefits. By that I mean like, you know, in the competition for spouses, if you wind up with the uh, 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 active, a wealthy, well-educated spouse, you benefit from having such a spouse quite apart from the fact that your spouse benefits from having those features. So to the extent that being bigger compromises your ability to acquire, quote unquote, a better spouse, then that's one other mechanism by that weight uh, could affect uh, your uh, earning potential. Or there could be some other common factor. Uh, we've already introduced this idea before, some personality traits, some genetic background, that is both partly responsible for your income and uh, for your, uh, your weight status. And here's some suggestive evidence that the relationship can indeed go from BMI to income rather than from income to BMI. This, uh, this slide, these data show the effect of overweight in adolescence on subsequent socioeconomic characteristics among men. So let's look at young men uh, when they're <coughs> teenagers and see how big or small they are, relatively speaking, measuring their BMI, and then measure a bunch of socioeconomic outcomes much later in life. 
And these are data from a nationally representative sample of 10,000 young men, randomly selected from around the country between the ages of 16 and 24 in 1981. And follow-up data were obtained roughly 10 years later. And the characteristics of the subjects who had been overweight in 1981 were compared to those for young people with asthma, musculoskeletal abnormal abnormalities, and other chronic health conditions. So how, for example, does it compare for your long-term prospects to have asthma as a young person versus being heavy as a young person? And men who had been overweight were less likely to be married. They were 11% less likely. And they also earned less and were less likely to have completed college. And in contrast, people with other chronic conditions did not differ in these ways from non-overweight subjects. So obesity was special compared to these other kinds of afflictions of young men uh, with respect to the long-term labor and marriage market uh, performance um, in these areas. So what this slide shows is uh, uh, this effect of overweight in adolescence. Uh, and so this is the various outcomes. What fraction were married? What's your household income? Do you live in poverty? How many years of college do you complete? Did you complete college? And what's your self-esteem? Uh, and this is the uh, this is a crude estimate of the difference. This is among boys who are overweight compared to the non-overweight group. And this is after adjusting using a regression model. And what it finds is that they were 11% less likely to be married. They earned about almost $3,000 less if you're an obese adolescent compared to not over the life course. Five, you have five percent, five percentage points more likely to be in poverty, at about a, a, a fifth of a year less education, five percent less likely to have completed college, five percentage points, and also a slightly lower uh, self-esteem, but that is not statistically significant. So young people who were overweight in the 1980s had these adverse long-term consequences, but in the, that period of time didn't think less of themselves. So there was no evidence of an effect of overweight on self-esteem uh, at least in this cohort of young men from this epoch. And this self-esteem finding is interesting because overweight men uh, tend to tolerate their height. And in fact, it turns out that there's a notable lack of correspondence between self-assessed and objective weight status in men and women alike. And I think this is taken from your readings. Um, so, so here we can look at the, uh, the, uh, the medical standard, are you overweight, normal, or underweight, using the BMI. And here we look at your self-evaluation of weight status. Do you think you're overweight, just right, or underweight in a sample of 41,000 people? And we're trying to understand, well, if you're overweight, do you see yourself overweight, yes or no? And what we find, for example, is in this population that amongst those individuals who were, uh, these are, uh, 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 these are men, let me just double check. Ah, this is overall sample, but in general what we find is, is that, for example, 4,000 people, or 10% of the sample, who were overweight, uh, I'm sorry, who were normal weight, thought they were overweight. And 5,000 people who were overweight thought they were just right. So 12% of the population. 12% of the population is actually clinically overweight, but thinks they're doing just fine. Actually, some of them even think they're underweight. So a small fraction of the people who are very obese think there's no problem uh, with their weight. And conversely, the other extreme, there are some people who are very underweight, but they think uh, they're overweight. So the off-diagonal elements give you people where there's a mismatch between self-perception and some kind of objective reality. And this discordance of self-evaluation with respect to medical standards, this discordance is also socially patterned. So it's not just that your weight is socially patterned, that blacks are heavier than whites, or or, or women are more likely to be obese than men, and blah, 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 or the poor are more likely to be obese than, than the rich. But the discrepancy between your perceptions of whether you're overweight or not also varies according to some of these socioeconomic attributes. For example, compared to men, unsurprisingly, women are almost five times more likely to overassess their body size. So living in the world that we do, with all kinds of expectations about female appearance, women who are not clinically overweight are much more likely to think they're overweight than men who are analogously, uh, have an analogous body size. And those who are young, white, wealthier, or more educated are more likely to overassess their weight status. Those who are young, white, wealthier, and more educated are more likely to overestimate their true wealth status. And norms regarding acceptable body types are also socially patterned, as, as you saw, for example, uh, in the readings. And, and body size is itself socially constructed. Our attitudes about acceptable body size 
our, our own attitudes. We manufacture those attitudes. And being overweight or obese actually increases your risk of death by about 31%. This slide shows the years of life gained by being active compared to being sedentary. So, um, so this is data taken from a sample of uh, Harvard alumni followed for a very long time period. Uh, and this shows the age of entry into the study. Uh, and this shows the difference between people who are, have an active, uh, this is added life from an active lifestyle in men at the age of 80. So following them up to the age of 80, uh, the men gained about two years of life if they had an active compared to an inactive lifestyle. And this paper was published a few years ago. And actually the, the amount of activity required, it was calculated, corresponded to climbing less than 20 flights of stairs per week or an extra three flights of stairs per day. So just climbing an extra three flights of stairs per day was associated with a 23% decrease uh, in the risk of death, okay? So just a little extra exercise every day has a meaningful long-term impact on your uh, mortality. Now when this paper was published, it led to a variety of exchanges uh, in the New England Journal where it was published. So the critics said, look, if you add up how much time it takes to walk three flights of stairs, it takes about 60 seconds. And if you add that all up across the life course, we see here that you gain about an extra uh, three months of life, but by this calculation, you spend it walking the stairs. Uh, so maybe that's not such a great thing. You know, you're going to live longer, but the whole time you're like Sisyphus, you know, climbing, climbing stairs. Uh, and, but, but, this then raises another interesting philosophical point, which we'll come back to later in the course, which is when you lengthen someone's life, you don't just uh, tack on uh, years like in the middle, like I'm not adding years right now to your life. You're adding them on at a different epoch in time. So you're gaining those years, let's say, in 2050. And it might be quite valuable to you to be alive in 2050, even if you've spent a little bit of time throughout your life uh, walking upstairs. So it's not just a question of years of life added, it's sort of when in the course of your life do you gain those years, and when in the course of human history uh, are those years uh, acquired. And here's some similar findings from your readings, uh, taken directly from your readings. This shows the cumulative mortality rate uh, from age 50 according to physical activity level, and you know, mortality is highest among individuals, so these are more deaths up here. Uh, amongst the people who have the lowest physical activity rating. It's a pretty graded uh, curve along all parts of the life course. But other more recent work actually complicates this picture quite a bit. Because it suggests that there's some subtlety here in terms of whether and how overweight and obesity per se raise the risk of death. And it depends on whether you are merely overweight or properly obese, so these averages may obscure important subtleties about where on the distribution you are and where, you know, does some extra weight, is there like a step function, like there's no increased risk until your BMI crosses 30 and then your risk goes up like this, or is it a smooth kind of function so every extra few pounds has the harms you in some way? And people aren't 100% sure about this uh, relationship, but you can't be sure if you just look at the averages. So for example, the risk depends on whether you are merely overweight or properly obese, how obese you are, and what cause of death we are speaking of, and actually even how old you are. For example, obesity appears to raise the risk of death primarily through its effect on cardiovascular disease. And the risk may only rise substantially when your BMI is above 30. So just being overweight may not actually be harmful to you. And obesity has a less discernible, if any, effect on the risk of all cancers uh, combined. So if you look at this now, what this slide shows is on the, y, on the y axis is different levels of BMI, and on the x axis is risk of, X, of something bad happening to you, so cardiovascular disease, for example, and then for different age groups, 25 to 59 year olds and 60 to 69 year olds, and different causes of death, cardiovascular disease and cancer. So what this slide says here is, is that, for example, if your BMI, if you're younger than 60, is above 30, and only when it crosses above 30, and in fact, maybe only when you get to 35, then and only then do you have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So among younger people, actually being slightly overweight may not have any impact on your cardiovascular disease. And with respect to cancer, there's no effect anywhere according to these data. 
Okay, so actually obesity is not increasing your risk for cancer in this study. It's only increasing your risk for obesity and only when it's very high with respect to cardiovascular disease. And now you can look at 60 to 69 year olds, the story for cancer is roughly the same. Here, when you're older, there may be some increased risk beginning at a lower threshold uh, of BMI. So it's not so simple, right? The public health, the, the, the science is not so simple, uh, and the findings and the implications aren't so simple either. And this is a hotly contested area right now. Lots of people doing different kinds of studies trying to sort out where, you know, what are the thresholds? Is it monotonic? Is it linear to the effect? Uh, what kinds of diseases and what kinds of people does it make um, a difference? However, it's clear that even if obesity doesn't kill you, it's very bad for your health in all kinds of other ways, short of death, such as, for example, its effect on disability and the other socioeconomic and personal effects we discussed a moment ago. Now, obesity, of course, is not just an individual problem, but also a public. Is that clear? Yeah, Gianna. Unclear. So uh, one possibility is, is that if the study hasn't been well designed and well controlled, it's capturing people with cancer here, as you're suggesting, who are very thin because of their cancer. And so this is not that the low weight is causing cancer, but that the cancer is causing low weight. And it's also not clear if it's quite statistically significant. It looks like the confidence interval just touches uh, the line here. So this could be a, a parabolic shape, or it could just be a line and some fluctuations in the data. Yeah, there could be some unknown or unmeasured coincident cancer in these uh, situations. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. What's your name? <coughs> Daniel, uh-huh. Uh, uh, yes. We don't really know. We think there were lots of changes in our society. We'll return to, this. over the rest of the course, we'll come back to some of these changes. What, you know, we think that there was a progressive move to more sedentary lifestyles, increasing suburbanization of the United States. Um, the declining real price of food. We'll talk about some of, some of, in fact, we'll talk about all of these things in just a moment. What I can't tell you is whether those developments were inflected in the 1980s or not. We don't really understand exactly which types of developments in our society changed when. Many things were changing at once over a broad period of time, but it looks like there was some kind of perfect storm in the 1980s that began to affect um, people. Other <coughs> yeah, what's your name? Matt. Matt, uh-huh. We don't know. That's a really good question. And the other thing that's happening is, is that some people have snarkily uh, noted that you know, if you smoke, you lose weight. And uh, there's been a decline in tobacco consumption in our society in the last 30 years, which is a huge success. We've gotten people to stop smoking. Maybe people have gained weight as a result. The French are thinner than we are, but have you been to France? Raise your hands if you've been to France. Can you smell the cigarette smoke when you go to France? It's incredible, right? Everyone's smoking all the time here. And compared to our society, where it's much less common. And they're thinner, so maybe, maybe that's what's keeping them thin. So lots of things are going on. It's very hard to be certain uh, what these relationships are. But the main intellectual point here is that there's a secular change, okay? Everyone is getting bigger, all right? It's not just like some group of people uh, is getting bigger, but no one else. Um, so it's not the case, for example, like the caricature of the stereotype in the literature is that you know, poor African-American women are getting bigger. Yes, they are getting bigger, but they're not the only ones. Everyone is getting bigger. Okay, so seeing this as a problem through the racial lens is, is again, like we talk about race, it is it's complicated. Because on the one hand, it is true there's a patterning by race, but to do that is to like highlight the race to the, to the neglect of all these other factors, which are also equally important uh, when you're looking at the problem, the public health problem. So at the population uh, level, uh, so these are, these are some, in fact, that, uh, Daniel, right? Daniel, what's your name? Daniel just asked, what are some of the causes? I don't know whether they happened in the 80s or not, but here's a long list of some of the things that's been happening that are might be potential environmental triggers or causes of the obesity uh, epidemic. Because at the population level, a BMI of 30 results in the loss of about three months of life expectancy at birth, and the BMI of 35 in a loss of about a year of life expectancy at birth. And the public health, this public health aspect of obesity raises our usual concerns 
but how to understand the problem from a collective or an individual perspective in terms of structure or agency or both. And it turns out that there are numerous environmental factors that whatever your own agency is, whatever your own desires for your body are, to be bigger or smaller, up to you, there are things around you that uh, abet or constrain of that desire. So for example, there are changes in social norms about what an acceptable body size is. People are changing their ideas across time. There's a transition to sedentary service sector economy. There's the invention of labor-saving devices of all sorts. There's sedentary entertainment options. So instead of kids actually playing baseball, they play, you know, Super Mario baseball or something, <laughs> uh, which is not quite as demanding. Well, I mean, in certain ways. Um, there's a reliance on motorized transportation. There's a suburbanization and sprawl, so people have to drive everywhere instead of walking. There's a declining real price of food. Actually, food, I, I forgot the precise number, some of you may know, but you know, 50 or 100 years ago, a significant fraction of the American household budget was spent buying food. And now it's like 5 or 10%. We can feed ourselves for almost nothing, actually. It's so easy to, to acquire food. Amongst the Hadza, do you know what fraction of the time Hadza hunter-gatherers spent gra uh, looking for food? Take a guess. It's about five hours a day. Every adult spends five hours a day acquiring the calories they need to eat. What do you guys do? Spend two minutes going to you know, your dining hall, and there it is, and you're done. Someone paid the bill, your parents, or, or whatever. Uh, you really don't spend very much time getting, uh, getting food at all. It's really cheap. Um, there's the problem of increased portion sizes, food advertising, and fast food. There are other social changes. For example, uh, some have thought, some thought that the feminist movement has paradoxically contributed to the obesity epidemic because women now, appropriately, have more occupational outlets for themselves. So we have fewer and fewer people, they historically were women, at home cooking for their families, now changing the composition of foodstuffs because of uh, women entering uh, the labor force. There's a decline in smoking as well, which I mentioned, other social changes. And some people have begun to speculate that there be, could be changes in the microbiome, that actually the, the, uh, the bacteria that are colonizing our intestine are different than the bacteria that colonized the intestine of Americans 30 or 40 years ago, and that these bacteria are contributing in part to our, um, to our uh, obesity epidemic. And this may reflect the rise, the wiser rise of antibiotics. So what's happened in our society in the last 50 years? There's just like, it's like I'm just putting antibiotics in the water. Antibiotics are everywhere. They're in our foods. Your doctors give them to you when, they don't, when you don't need them. People take them for the slightest problems. This changes your gut flora. It's happening everywhere. The gut flora is being reset by the introduction of antibiotics. And that this change in gut flora may be on a macro scale one of the small contributors as well to the obesity uh, epidemic. But what's, what's clear is that our genes themselves are not changing. So even though there are genetic risks for obesity, your genes haven't changed. Our genes haven't changed in the last 50 years. Something else has happened, which some of us are more uh, um, placed at risk for because of our genes than others, but it's not our genes that are contributing uh, to this uh, phenomenon. We'll discuss this later in the course. Anyway, some hint of the role of both social norms and environmental factors can be seen by the geographic patterning of the obesity epidemic. So for example, if you look at men, uh, uh, men at the top and women at the bottom uh, in 1990 and 2000, by state, and here the states with the uh, biggest average BMI, or the percentage of the state inhabitants with the biggest BMI, so the darkest red have more than 35% of the inhabitants obese, you can see that amongst males, uh, you know, for very, no states like in 1990 have that, but everyone is getting redder just 10 years later. In some states like Mississippi and Texas, a, a significant fraction of the men are obese. To the, you know, in preference, for example, to my home state of Vermont, where people are doing you know, much better. Uh, and if you look at women, you see that the entire nation of women is just you know, crossing the threshold uh, in the 1990s uh, in some way, but that even here it's patterned uh, in different uh, sorts of ways, with some states having more obesity than other states and larger uh, weight gain. Mississippi has first in the nation's status in terms of obesity, and some rural counties uh, in Mississippi have obesity, obesity, not just overweight, obesity prevalence in adults of close to 40% of the adults. And norms regarding this are also changing. In 1985, 55% of US adults said they found overweight people less attractive than others, but 20 years later, in 2005, less than half that number, 24% said so. So our ideas about uh, 
the acceptability of body, bigger body sizes uh, are changing. And social norms are changing to the point where there is even an action-oriented organization, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, or NAFA, that frames its claims in terms of civil rights. For example, and it says, you know, we need to have a kind of civil rights movement for, for bigger people. And for example, here's some photos from clicking on the URL for the 2005 NAFA convention. So here's the NAFA convention, here's uh, the website, and here's some photos of the website, and here's one uh, image uh, from that website. Now this is a difficult to talk about and actually very complicated uh, phenomenon. Because on the one hand, we're strongly opposed to discrimination and hatred and victim blaming on the one hand, and we should always be mindful of our common humanity, right? I am not interested in saying, you know, I'm not interested in making this woman an object of scorn or mockery, right? Although, you know, it's like, you know, it's almost inviting that kind of uh, attitude when you see images like that. But that's not what I'm interested in doing. But at the same time, I don't want a kind of public health posture that says there's nothing wrong with this image, right? That there's nothing wrong with being this big. And to be honest, I don't know how to square that circle. On the one hand, not interested in kind of victim blaming or otherizing, saying, oh, those people over there. But on the other hand, wanting to say, look, this is not quite right. Our society is not sustainable. It's not healthy for us to get so big and to, and to think nothing of people that are truly quite this large. Because how can it be a good thing to glorify this state of affairs? It's actually very confusing. And in fact, some have even contended that it's not just the norms, so that's an attitude, that little argument was, had to do with the norms, changing norms about acceptable body size, which have become more permissive, and it's hard to argue against more tolerance, but maybe there's a problem there. Uh, and another thing that's happened is the plentiful supply of excess calories being produced by the food industry, with encouraging government policies and agricultural subsidies, which are then dumped on the market that can also be seen as to blame. So what the idea here is, is that our, our agricultural, our national agricultural policy is such as to distort the actual cost of manufacturing calories of different kinds. So we wind up making it really cheap to make high fructose corn syrup. So that the dollars per calorie to produce high fructose corn syrup, because of our tax policy, becomes very small. So what happens to all that high fructose corn syrup that's produced? It has to find an outlet. It's sold. It enters your foodstuffs. Things you don't even think about as having high fructose corn syrup, like your bread, for example, do. It just is everywhere. It's just finding an outlet in all kinds of ways. And Marion Nestle makes very compelling arguments about this in her well-known book called Food Politics. So this shows federal subsidies for food production. So vegetables get almost no assistance. Uh, neither do nuts and legumes or grains and so forth. But meat and dairy products get a tremendous amount of assistance. And this, on the other hand, is the federal nutrition recommendation. So this is a pyramid that describes what we should be eating, and this is the pyramid that describes where our tax dollars are facilitating the production of food of that kind. So if we had a rational public health policy, we would make it easier and let more cost effective to manufacture the foods which we know are salubrious, which are health affirming, and not the other way around, driven by some other kind of typical political uh, agenda. And in fact, there's a very provocative correlational evidence regarding the high fructose corn syrup hypothesis that I mentioned a moment ago. This shows consumption of fructose and increase in obesity in the United States from 1961 to 2000. So here, on this, uh, this, is the, uh, this line here shows the growth of, uh, of high fructose corn syrup, in, in, uh, in highlighted in purple, and this shows the fraction of obese Americans here. And this inflection here just precedes this subtle inflection that's also visible here, and this inflection is different than the other kinds of, uh, you know, prevalence of other kinds of fructose and free fructose. So it seems to be something in particular about this high fructose corn syrup that may, may be contributing to the gain in weight uh, over this time period. And in fact, refined sugars, such as sucrose and fructose, uh, were absent in the diet of most people until very recently in human history. So other than honey, natural honey, we had very limited access to this type of very highly sweetened uh, things until, until the sugarcane industry, actually beets before that, uh, like took off in the last couple hundred years. And overconsumption of sugar-dense foods and beverages is initially motivated by the pleasure of sweet taste and often is compared to being addicted to drugs. 
And in fact, sugar can be so delightful in so many ways that it's actually as tempting as cocaine experiments with rats show. So in this experiment here, the rats were fitted out with a little intravenous device, and if they hit a lever, they could get a little shot of intravenous cocaine, or they could go and drink some sugar water. And then the rats were tested to see which of these things they preferred, and actually they much preferred drinking the sugar water uh, than uh, pressing the lever. Let's get all of a sudden, the problem has occurred. Turn the power off and then back on. It's a prompt that's going to replace the lamp. <laughs> I'm not going to do any of that. <laughs> I'm going to try to soldier on and, and pray. <clears throat> Sam, would you remember to email the AV department so that by next Thursday this is addressed? Okay. So, um, so, uh, so anyway, the rats much prefer to uh, make them come disappear. It didn't, though. It's dark here. I can see it. Um, uh, so um, anyway, so I better hurry up because I don't want to run out of slides and light. Uh, so the bottom line here is they preferred the sugar to the cocaine uh, in this rat uh, experiment. Um, and this, um, uh, in this experiment. And these types of effects are not trivial because even a slight increase or decrease in the average calorie intake can have huge population level effects. So this slide shows the current rate of excess energy stored by 20 to 4 year olds in the United States. So every day, on average, people are consuming an extra 15 calories per day. So that's just a very tiny amount of extra calories that everyone is consuming. But that tiny amount of extra calories actually adds up over the course of a lifetime to be many, many extra pounds of weight that everyone is getting. Basically, if every American ate half a chocolate bar less per day, we would wipe out the ob obesity epidemic. The obesity epidemic is the cumulative product of very small increases in, uh, in calorie consumption uh, in the population. And portion size is another issue that's a problem. Here is just a contrast between portion sizes uh, from the 1950s or you know, the last 50 to 100 years and today. So here's what a hamburger looked like 30 or 40 years ago. Here's what it looks like today. Here's a standard McDonald's french fries. I think that says 1950 or 1960 there. Uh, and here's what it is today. Here's a Hershey bar. A Hershey bar was two ounces when it was first introduced. And now it's, I don't know, whatever, it's seven ounces. Here's a Coca-Cola that was six ounces when you used to be able to buy them, you know, in Happy Days. This is that in 1916. Now it's 16 fluid ounces. It's, I don't know, whatever it is, four times as large. Here's a movie popcorn. I mean, you know, you go into a movie theater and you want to buy a little popcorn, you can't. You know, the whole system is rigged for you to get a big tub of popcorn. It's pre-buttered, it's salty, it's the low marginal cost, you know. Have you ever noticed it's like $3.50 for the small and $4.50 for the large, which is four times larger, and you're like, I'm not an idiot, I'm gonna get the, you know. <laughs> but, 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 but that's the, it's like the, the deck is stacked against you, you know. You just are gonna buy the, uh, the bigger popcorn. You don't have a choice. And in fact, there are varying kinds, given all of these secular changes in our society, there are varying kinds of interventions or changes we could make uh, at the individual and the collective level that, would, uh, that could help us in a variety of ways. So we could begin to think about intrapersonal level changes we could make, interventions that intervene in people's motivational and motivation and skills. So I'm going to think about focusing on you as individuals. How am I going to change your motivation? and your skills so that you can have the body size that you want. Or the interpersonal level, how can we target social norms and networks? So now I'm going to focus on the interactions between people, that's my interventional level. Or at the organizational and environmental level, looking at schools and workplaces and hospitals. Maybe I'm going to do something about Yale that makes Yale less, or this movie theater, less obesogenic. I'm going to say, you know, you're going to sell smaller popcorn in this theater. Or maybe at the community level, structural changes or advocacy. You know, maybe I'm going to put bike paths to make it easier for people to ride their bikes. Or maybe at the policy level, by promulgating laws and regulations that uh, actually improve public health in a variety of ways. <coughs> and it's important to realize, to not be pessimistic about these things. Because things can change. Just look at the decline in smoking we've had in our society. From 45% of adults were smokers in 1965, to less than 20% today. <clears throat> and there's been a cultural shift in our attitudes towards smoking. Right now, it used to be you could smoke anywhere. Now it's hard to find a place to smoke. Literally, in one generation, we've gone from smoking being the default permissible condition to non-smoking being the default that's set. Or look at changes in sexual behaviors prompted by the AIDS epidemic. 
I mean, they're condoms. I think they're condoms. Raise your hand. They're condoms. Are there condoms? <laughs> so I'm thinking the laundry rooms at Yale have condom dispensers in them. Is that right? Yes? No? Okay, raise your hands if the laundry rooms at Yale have condoms in them. Raise your hands if you think they don't have condoms. Raise your hands if you've never looked and don't care about condoms. <laughs> well, the, the Harvard laundry rooms have condoms in them, guys. I can tell you that. Uh, so Yale should too, as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, this is a radical shift, right? The idea that we've gone, you know, because of the AIDS epidemic and other kinds of changes regarding attitudes towards sexuality in young people, we've completely changed in 30 years to the point where now we have a kind of public health harm prevention, a posture, so that we literally have condom dispensers in college, uh, you know, dorm, not dorm rooms, but, you know, laundry rooms. Dorm rooms would be another problem. Um, and, uh, or in fact, drunk driving laws. Uh, we've had drunk driving laws that have also changed radically. And we've gone from 30% of fatal crashes in 1982 involving drunk drivers to 17% uh, just uh, 20 years later. So laws can change, practices can change, ideas, things can change. And I believe that the same thing could happen with obesity. Now let's look at some of these policy interventions uh, in different sorts of ways. In fact, many laws have been passed or are under consideration to combat the obesity epidemic by focusing on schools including restricting access to sodas and other high-calorie, low-nutritive uh, foodstuffs. So here's a bunch of high schoolers hanging out in the high school uh, cafeteria. I mean, you can kind of immediately get the impression for what's available to them uh, to eat, what kind of images they're being bombarded with, how their brain is being stimulated. And another target is school lunches, and not just because they're lousy. Uh, who can tell me what these meals are? Raise your hands if you're familiar with these meals. These are school lunches. Has anyone had these school lunches before? You guys all go to elite private schools where they have really nutritious food? Okay, who can tell me what, uh, even, even with a dim light, who can tell me what this is here? Yeah, spaghetti and meat sauce, here's a little rope, these are gross beans, there's an orange to try to freshen it up a little bit. Uh, what's this here? Tacos, right, yeah, very standard fare. You guys all, I'm assuming most of you have these at lunches. Uh, you know, this is a little soup, what is this? Can you tell what this is there? Meatball sandwich, sub, exactly, a little corn, there's an apple, there's a little soup. Uh, this, this is, who knows what this is? You can't even tell what this slot is. It's on the, it's on the, I forgot what it's called. It's called a, not Welsh rare bit. We used to call it a, I forgot what it's called. Uh, it's gross. Uh, <laughs> these are chicken nuggets. Here's franks and beans. Here's mac and cheese. I mean, these are standard lunches, guys. These are standard lunches that are given to public school students around the country. And I'm surprised that more of you, if you just have, want to repress uh, your memory uh, of, of these lunches, okay? Now these are school lunches in Japan. Who can tell me what these are? Some of you, one or two of you must know what these is. Yeah? Anyone? Raise your hands. Yeah, Gianna, what are these things here? Um, well, it looks like one of the miso soup. Okay, well this is some, this one here is a little rice. This could be miso, yeah. A little, a little fish, I'm sorry, here's some rice. Here's some fresh uh, cucumbers. Here's some soybeans. Uh, and here's some kind of nutritional drink. It's a completely different uh, lunch that's offered to Japanese public school students than it's offered to American uh, students. So you have to wonder whether we could do something structural in the environment that would make a difference uh, in this way. And in fact, there's all kinds of state legislative initiatives to combat obesity in schools. I think this is taken from your readings. Yes, it is. Uh, that looks at different kinds of ways that we could think about, okay, what laws could we pass that would make it easier for us to deal with a problem of obesity via intervening in school? So could we have physical education requirements and funding, nutritional education requirements and funding, vending machine restrictions, nutritional standards for cafeteria food, outreach to parents, or other efforts to promote a healthy school and environment? <laughs> this is just a, a, just a crude counting of number of pieces of legislation enacted, pending, and introduced, but not adopted uh, in this sample that's discussed in your readings. And in fact, the law can be a very effective in improving public health, as we'll see next time to a much greater extent when we talk about smoking. But all laws have also been reduced, have also been implemented, and have successfully reduced over the last 30 years uh, all kinds of other public health uh, threats. Have reduced our exposure to toxic lead, have improved car safety and reduced motor vehicle accidents, have increased vaccination rates, and have reduced occupational fatalities. So laws can save lives and improve public health if properly you know, uh, 
formed and implemented. <coughs> and legislative efforts have also focused on the community level. So here are some examples of laws uh, you know, that we can look at outside of schools. So creating various task forces and commissions, okay, fine. Taxing non-nutritional foods. A lot of movements around the country now to try to have the tax structure reflect the nutritional content of food. Improving safety for walking and biking. Making attractive places for outdoor exercises. Restricting advertising. Having community fitness campaigns or workplace fitness campaigns. Or insurance coverage manipulations of different kinds. All kinds of ways we can imagine using the law as an effective tool to change and improve uh, public health, now again at the community level. And in fact, there was a bill filed in, uh, in 2008 in Mississippi, apparently because the legislature was motivated by its first in nation status with respect to obesity. And this law was, quote, an act to prohibit certain food establishments from serving food to any person who is obese based on criteria prescribed by the State Department of Public Health. What do you think of that law? Is that a good law? Hard, right? Hard to come up with good laws that, you know, that don't border into this type of, uh, of practice. Or here's another example. There was Bloomberg's initiative uh, a couple of years ago in New York City. And that initiative was a limit on soft drink size was to have taken place in March of 2013. And the law, passed by eight members of the city's health board, intended to prohibit the sale of many sweetened drinks more than 16 ounces, or half a liter, in size. And under the plan, all restaurants, fast food joints, delis, movie theaters, sports stadiums, and food carts would be barred from selling sugar-sweetened drinks in cups larger than 16 ounces. And this initiative was not only supported by Mayor Bloomberg, but also by his opponent, the incoming mayor, Bill de Blasio. And opponents to this included beverage companies which launched campaigns against the ban. Um, and the limit was to be enforced by the city's regular restaurant inspection team. And the plans fell through due to the invalidation of the law by the New York Supreme Court Judge Milton Tingling, uh, but the city uh, ultimately appealed uh, the ruling. So you have to weigh kind of to what extent are we going to constrain individual agency and our liberties if we're also simultaneously going to advance public health? It sort of may offend the conscience to suggest that a restaurant would refuse to serve someone who is heavy, you know, in their sort of capricious judgment. But this one isn't so bad, actually, imagining that you just restrict the size of the drinks. But maybe other people would be offended by this. You know, we have to think about where and how you're going to go about implementing these regulations. Just last week in California, uh, beverage companies are opposing another bill. State Senator Bill Monning just last week introduced legislation that would require warnings on sweetened beverages that had more than 75 calories per 12 ounces. And under the bill, the warning label on your food would read, drinking beverages with added sugars contributes to obesity, diabetes, uh, and tooth decay. So that seems a little less problematic, right? Like on the spectrum, from refusing to feed people to regulating what they can buy to simply informing them of their information, you have to decide and debate for yourselves where on that spectrum you might fall. And sometimes legal interventions have been supplemented by a very interesting idea we'll be discussing this time and next time called counter-marketing campaigns. So, um, so here's an example of a counter-marketing campaign, a very simple one. It says, childhood obesity, don't take it lightly. So we're going to put in the city, there's a little billboard that sort of announces to people, you know, pay attention to obesity, uh, don't take it lightly. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that that's just a drop in the bucket. Uh, that this is right above the McDonald's billboard that says, you know, I, my kind of shopping spree, I'm loving it. Uh, two big bags of, uh, of food with fries and so forth. Side by side, literally, uh, these billboards. And yet the documentary supersized me. Raise your hands if you saw this documentary. Yeah, it's a great documentary. It illustrates how effective counter-marketing can be. Raise your hands if you saw that documentary and thought, I'm not going to be eating this crap anymore. Very tempting, right? But then who, who still ate the crap? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but it nevertheless, you know, it might limit a little bit, like how much you eat. It might have an effect on you, countermanding some of the effect, the kind of inundation of advertising that's trying to sell you uh, this sort of stuff. And this, this documentary premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in January of 2004, and less than two months later, McDonald's announced that it would no longer sell any of the other item, any, any other menu items in the supersize although they denied that the, the movie, that move was a reaction to the film. So in this movie, this man says that he's only going to eat McDonald's food three meals a day, uh, and when he orders his food, if the person offering him the food says, 
sir, would you like that supersize? He would have to say yes. Uh, and half the time, uh, that's what the McDonald's clerk would say, because of course they're trying to upsell and sell more of the product. And so over the course of the 30 days, he gained, I forgot how many pounds, he became impotent, his liver function test began to you know, uh, be derailed. People were very concerned about him, very theatrically, uh, in the movie. His girlfriend was being interviewed, he was being interviewed, uh, and so forth. And in fact, if you don't move, it's quite true, uh, you get fat. And this is a, uh, yeah, this is, I'm sorry, so this is another counter-marketing campaign, taking an iconic image, you know, Michelangelo's David, manipulating it to be kind of shocking, and then underneath, you can't read it so well, it says, if you don't move, you get fat. And this is like intended as well to like stimulate you to think differently about how you are, are leading your life, a kind of counter-marketing effort, trying to countermand the stimuli that you're getting that are encouraging you to adopt these practices. And we'll be considering counter-marketing in great detail next time as it applies to smoking, but I wanted to close today by giving you a few examples. And, uh, and this is a condom ad. Uh, and uh, it, I hope it gets your attention. Uh, and um, and uh, I forgot what the line is. It says, yeah, it says, don't be stupid, okay? And uh, you know, like the, the idea here is, is that you know, there are different ways to be safe when, when confronted with danger, and condoms might be seen in this light, and it's meant to be slightly provocative and, and witty. Now, are there any questions so far? Yeah, what's your name? Avery. Avery, yeah. It would take a long time to unwind the epidemic we've had, but the point is, it's not a lot of extra calories per day that we all have to consume to give rise to the epidemic we're in the midst of. It's not like we're, eat, it's not like we're each having an extra pint of ice cream every day. It's just the small increments are <coughs> summated across the year and across, across time and across the population to give rise to this, um, to this epidemic. So just trying to benchmark the order of magnitude. About, a, about an extra 100 calories a day or less is what the epidemic adds up to. Yeah, what's your name? Tyler. Tyler. So today we posted on all these uses that we posted on America. Yes. Are there similar trends around? Yeah, so the, it's a worldwide epidemic. Uh, you even have, even in the developing world, you have crazy paradoxes where you have starving people at the bottom end of the income distribution and, uh, and obese people at the upper end of the distribution. And that actually can be confusing sometimes because the average weight in some of those countries might not look so bad but you've got a bimodal distribution and you've got serious problems at either extremity. But throughout the developing world, Australia has an obesity epidemic that's about as bad as ours. We're, near, we're among the worst, but the Europeans are not far behind us. Uh, the Russians, the Chinese increasingly are facing this, the Indians, um, you know, it's, it's a worldwide um, problem. Other points? Okay, I wanna close with two counter-marketing uh, videos uh, that are short and they're both on non-health related topics just to give you a flavor for uh, how inventive and potentially powerful this type of strategy can be. Uh, some of you may have seen either <coughs> one or both of these, uh, but just, just watch. Have you seen this one? Raise your hands if you've seen this one. Just a few, not so many.
so, uh, so what, what do you think of that? <laughs> Who wants to do a little analysis of that? Yeah, what's your name? <laughs> what? Joanna. Joanna, yeah. Uh, what kind of campaign yes, it was an Australian campaign. And what is it a campaign for? Staying in school. Okay, so it lures you in, happy teenagers, they're going to the beach, they're all very attractive, they're Australians, you know, they have a great time. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's totally kind of lures you in. I, when I first saw it, I didn't know what it was about. I, I, thought, it was, uh, I thought it was actually about a different uh, public health message, actually, than the stay in school message. Other ideas, I won't tell you what I thought. Go on, other ideas. That could be a, a condom, you know, thing. You know, like, it's hard to know where they're going as you're watching it. Yeah, other thoughts on this. Was it effective, not effective? <laughs> Yeah, what's your name? I'm Joyce. Joyce, yeah. It did not seem very effective to me because like the risk of me going into an explosive testing site because I skipped school at like zero, I thought I would show something like that. Maybe when you skip school at zero, Jared, but maybe, no, I'm sorry, one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it just didn't seem like it depicted the actual consequences of schooling, but went to such an extreme that my mind immediately thought like this was kind of yeah. the problem. Okay, so the intent is to suggest bad consequences if you skip school, but as Joanna's pointing out, they may have overdone it just a bit. Uh, so, so now it becomes like so implausible that the connection is lost, okay? So because they don't. But the thing is, why do they do that, do you think, Joanne? Why would they go to this extreme, do you think? Your, your name is Joanne, right? Oh, I'm Joyce. Joyce, I'm sorry. No, okay. Joyce, what do you think? Uh, I guess so it sticks in your memory. I probably will forget this from a while. Exactly. So that's the trade-off between, between, on the one hand, if they gave you the sort of the logical consequences, if you skip school, your lifetime earnings may be a bit less, and you know, you may not get exactly the husband you want, or you know, you know who cares? Right? But they make a kind of powerful like visual image, and I think that's, the, but it may then become so absurd that nobody really thinks you're going to be blown to bits if you cut class, you know, except this one. Yeah, what's, what's your name? You were going to say something? Rosario. Yeah, Rosario? Yeah. Yes, so the, the counter-marketing campaigns typically exploit like high production values, witty, visual stimuli. They have a whole set of ways in which they're organized. And either in this class or the next class, you're going to do a reading about them. Someone else in the back wanted to say, observe something about this one? Other thoughts about this video? It's, it's efficacy or it's production? Yeah, I forgot your name. Daniel? Yeah, Daniel? Daniel? Yeah. Yeah, it would actually work as a kind of you know anti-mining uh, you know thing again. But with the opposite, I had the same thought when I first watched it. When I saw the final message, "Don't slack off," I was like, "Really?" You know, I agree with you. Other thoughts? Who wants to see? Yeah, what's your name? Tiwa. What? Tiwa. Tiwa. Yeah. Um, I also think that it's like effective because like I could imagine like sharing this video with friends. Yes. Of just like. Like if it were just like, oh, like stay in school because it's good, I probably wouldn't like show anyone else but because it's like fun that I might like share it with like my family. Excellent. So Tio is your name? Tio is making an incredibly important point, which we're gonna come back to when we talk about social networks. So think about the access when you guys go see movies. When you think about movies, okay? They're movies that are good or bad, okay? They're like diseases that are lethal or non-lethal. And then distinct from that axis is whether the movie is a movie you would tell your friends about or not, whether the disease is communicable or not, okay? And we often conflate those things. We wrongly think, oh, you tell your friends about good movies. But actually, those are different things. You might tell your friends about a bad movie. I saw the worst movie, right? So what this thing is trying to do is manipulate the axis, the transmissibility axis. It's very shrewdly being designed to maximize its virality, which is distinct from the content of the thing itself. As you rightly pointed out, if it had been blander, you might have told nobody. So even though it might have been, to pick up Joyce's point, been more accurate and you might, you know, more reasonable, you wouldn't have, and maybe or had more or less impact. The other thing they're going for here is passing it along. So I see this video two or three years ago. I'm like, this is perfect for my class. I show it to you, a couple hundred kids. You guys, some of you will show it and so forth. Okay, who wants to see one more? Totally different one. Okay, also from Down Under. Some of you will have seen this one too. Uh, but um, or, uh, yeah, this is from Down Under too. Some of you will have seen this one. Uh, and this is the last one we'll talk about today. Raise your hands if you've seen this. Set fire to the hair. Hope to stay out of prison in bed. Eat medicine that's out of date. Using private parts as 
So this is effective counter-marketing. We'll return to this time next time. See you next time.